Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, the Virtual uh, Journal Club. It's really a pleasure uh, to be able to introduce our two speakers this morning um, who are really incredibly experienced in the field of thyroid oncology. Before I get started, I wanted to just acknowledge and thank um, uh, Lilly Oncology for their generous sponsorship. Our, our presenter this morning is Dr. Frank Warden, um, who came to medicine through a little bit of an atypical course, having um, started as a registered pharmacist and then going back to complete his medical training um, in medicine and pediatrics, and then following that with a Medonc uh, hematology fellowship at the University of Michigan. Um, he has remained on uh, faculty since 2000 um, and as a a uh, member of the University of Michigan Rogel Cancer Center, where he um, currently works as a clinical investigator with both um, an interest in head and neck oncology as well as uh, lung cancer and um, endocrine neoplasia. And so uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Warden for his um, for agreeing to present this morning. And this morning's discussant for those of us who um, are in the tri-state area, really needs no introduction. Dr. Eric Sherman is an associate attending at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. In, um, he is on the head and neck solid tumor service and has special um, interest and expertise in thyroid and other head and neck cancers um, with uh, an, um, an emphasis on working in clinical and translational research. He is well known to all of us who uh, see the worst of the worst in thyroid cancer and um, appreciate his efforts in helping that uh, unfortunate population of patients. And so with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Warden um, and uh, uh, Frank, go right ahead here. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, just gonna move this over here too. So good morning and, and thank you again for inviting me. It's um, always good to connect um, with old friends. So Eric and I go way back um, when we were both junior faculties studying thyroid cancer. Um, I have known each other um, through ASCO um, since then. So um, this morning's um, our article is a paper that we published um, shortly after um, serafinib and then um, limbatinib. Um, came on to the market. So trying to capture uh, a real world experience to see how um, clinicians were using um, uh, these um, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. I will say up front, as I was putting this together and talking about uh, the COVID pandemic, I forgot to put my disclosure slide on here. So I will just say that I have funding from the Merck Foundation, um, also from ASI. I have participated in um, clinical studies through Eli Lilly and have been on an advisory board for Eli Lilly and the Merck Foundation as well. Um, okay, uh, my screen's not advancing. Dr. Warden, if you click the, um, the arrow at the bottom left-hand side of the screen, that should help. The bottom of the left. Okay. Right, the arrows to oh, advance. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, and then there's a, the, the little box here. How do I, I want to get rid of that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I got off of down here. So, so just a little bit about thyroid cancer. So it represents about 3% of all new cancer cases in the United States. Um, cancers are rising. Um, we think maybe related to um, earlier detection and it's uh, projected to be the fourth most common cancer by the year 2030. Um, again, this long-term increase has been observed way back since the 70s um, to really the present day at a 4% annual increase in 2005 to 2014. Again, um, probably related to um, detection and um, subclinical, subclinical indolent um, cancers that now we are finding um, more easily. Okay. So we know that the differentiated um, thyroid cancers arise from the follicular cells and they account for about 90% of um, thyroid cancers. And, and amongst those, um, we see the papillary um, thyroid cancers of which mutations are um, common amongst BRAF, follicular, um, and the, the form of follicular um, called peripheral cell or oncocytic um, thyroid cancer. 
And then also rising from the follicular cells are the anaplastic thyroid cancer, which are probably the worst of all cancers and represent about one to 2% of um, these malignancies. And then arising from the parafollicular cells, we have the medullary thyroid cancers, primarily driven by RET um, mutations. And um, we see those in sporadic form and about 25% are um, associated with um, familial diseases. So um, when we you know, look at this all together, we um, primarily um, as clinicians treat um, the differentiated thyroid cancers. And as oncologists, um, we see them um, when they become radioactive, um, when we, they become radioactive iodine refractory. So most of these cases, 95% uh, are treated with surgery, followed by um, radioactive iodine therapy, and they don't you know, come to our clinics. They do come to our clinics um, when they become refractory iodine, and that's when we start treating them uh, potentially with the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So just a little bit about where we're at with the um, treatments for this disease. So early on, back when I started my career in the year 2000, patients with thyroid cancer would come to my clinic and we'd sit and we'd look at each other. Uh, essentially, we had nothing to offer these folks um, other than observation, perhaps radiation, and then maybe chemotherapy um, with adriamycin that was FDA approved. And then um, in um, 2011, uh, vendetinib was actually approved for uh, metastatic um, medullary thyroid cancer. And following that came cabozantinib, um, again, for medullary thyroid cancer. And it was in 2013 that the FDA approved um, the first treatment for the differentiated thyroid cancers that were radioactive iodine refractory when serafinib was approved. And shortly thereafter, in 2015, linvatinib was approved for um, differentiated thyroid cancers. And both of these drugs um, were compared against placebo. In the linvatinib was uh, improved progression-free um, survival by about six times, and twice um, that was seen with serafinib. So these became landmark studies for the treatment of um, RAI refractory uh, differentiated thyroid cancers. And then more recently here um, in uh, 2020, salperketinib has been proved for ret altered thyroid cancers for medullary as well as the differentiated thyroid cancers um, with fusions. And um, shortly thereafter, just about a week or so ago, pralcetinib has now received um, FDA approval. And in there also are um, larotrectinib and entrectinib, which were done as uh, basket trials and including in the basket trial were thyroid cancers that had NTREC um, fusions. So those are also agents available. So you can see now from where we started um, well back um, at 2000 and beyond with just chemotherapy, we now have um, six um, approved agents um, for thyroid cancers. So looking at this study, um, our aims were to look at the clinical benefit in the second line um, with these small molecule inhibitors, suggesting that we could get a benefit if we treat um, beyond using serafinib or perhaps lenvatinib. The question is, we just really didn't know. We do not have good sequencing data as we do in other cancers such as renal cell carcinoma, where we know we can start with exitinib perhaps and go to um, gabazantinib as defined first and second line um, strategies. So studies were conducted prior to the commercial availability of lenvatinib in 2015 and most were single site investigations. Overall study aim was to provide a more contemporary assessment of these small molecule inhibitors and a national administrative claims database was used to examine the real world prescribing patterns amongst patients who initiated um, therapy using the NCCN guidelines um, as a way of selecting therapies. So what we measured, baseline characteristics were determined during a three month pre-index period um, examined by the use of these um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors as frontline therapy, looking at age, gender, insurance plan, prescriber, et cetera. And the first line began on the index date, which was the date of the first prescription fill for the recommended um, SMKI. And the first lot ended at the earliest of one, the addition or substitution of a new agent. Um, a small molecule kinase inhibitor treatment discontinuation defined as a gap of greater than 60 days after the prescription runs out. Um, three, 
was death or four disenrollment from the health plan study um, to the end date. And then finally, the start of the second line of therapy and subsequent lines of therapy were defined as the addition or substitution of a new agent after the end of the first line of therapy. So this is basically the study design and data are in the data sources. So again, we have have two of these non-diagnostic um, medical claims for thyroid cancer at least 30 days apart. So we started out with um, a little over 50,000 um, patients in general. And then when we had greater than one um, or equal to one claim um, through the pharmacy of these NCCN recommended tyrosine kinase inhibitors for thyroid cancer, we came down to a number of uh, 295 patients. When we looked at age and then continuous health plan enrollment for at least greater than three months, is 239 patients, and then continuous health plan enrollment for at least one month or greater. And then finally, um, evaluating for no pharmacy claims for these um, agents during the baseline period left us with 217 patients. So 13 and a half million would have private insurance. And in 2014, 89% of US residents um, were insured. And inpatient, outpatient um, database claims, we use the ICD-9 uh, ICD coding and CPT coding um, primarily um, to identify these patients and prescriptions. And outpatient uh, pharmacy claims included national drug codes. And finally, the recommended NCCN agents are exitinib, cabazantinib, everolimus, linvatinib, azopinib, serafinib, sunitinib, and vendetinib. So what we weren't able to do is actually tell you if a patient was receiving a drug for medullary thyroid cancer or for a differentiated thyroid cancer, and we could not identify who the patients were. So there wasn't any um, issues related to um, HIPAA compliance. And so kind of looking at the selection process um, graphically here, you can see the three month um, baseline uh, with thyroid cancer and no treatment. And then the start of the first line um, therapy and then moving on to the second line therapy and then the third line therapy with follow up thereafter. So the statistics for this study, so the difference between the line of therapy uh, regimen cohorts for baseline characteristics, duration of follow-up, and line of therapy duration were examined by ANOVA test, um, continuous variables, and chi-square test for categorical variables. And the time to discontinuation for these tyrosine kinase regimens in um, one, two, and three um, was estimated by the Kaplan-Meier method to account for um, the um, the treatment regimen um, censoring cohort differences uh, were assessed then by um, a log rank test. So this is the patient characteristics. So this is a you know, relatively busy slide. So I tried to contain most of the slides, but this one I put up here showing that the majority of the patients were female patients. Um, you can see that the mean age was in the 60s, which is what we um, pretty much expect. Um, and we can see that patients um, where they varied um, with um, commercial insurance or not, or having Medicare that was involved. We looked at the um, comorbidity index scores, as well as the prescribing um, clinicians, which was interesting to see here that um, the highest number of those who are prescribing these medications were actually the endocrinologists and not necessarily um, the medical oncologists. So summarizing the results then, um, the mean duration of follow-up was about 500 days and about 36% of patients received a second line um, of therapy or later. And amongst those um, with greater than 12 month follow up after the first line of therapy, about 53% went on to receive a, a second line of therapy. And the median treat, uh, duration of treatment was about five months um, for the first line of therapy and about five months for the second line of therapy. Um, over the entire follow up period from 2010 to 2016, serafinib was the most common regimen, as we would expect, since this drug was. Um, approved first in the first line of therapy, as well as in the second line of therapy. And then sunitinib and lenvatinib um, in the first line of therapy, um, and sunitinib um, in the second line of therapy, you can see at 13% um, and then 19%. And then starting in 2015, when lenvatinib was FDA approved, lenvatinib became the most common first line regimen, as we would um, expect. We know that the response rates for lenvatinib are much higher at 62% versus 12% with serafinib. And again, looking at the progression-free survival that we talked about, it wasn't surprising that there was a shift using this um, agent. 
So putting this together in a figure, we can see that um, for the first line of therapy at, at 64% of the patients, and then these were people who had um, about one month or greater of follow-up, and then subsequently 35% of folks, and then patients who had um, been on a treatment for uh, follow-up of greater than 12 months, you can go on and see that there was a 53% um, second line of therapy. So second line of therapy ranging from depending on the amount of follow-up ranged from somewhere around 35% up to 53%. So if we look at um, patients who are receiving you know, lines of therapy in the front line as well as the second line, overall what this, this busy um, graph or slide will tell you is that serafinib was primarily used. And as you can see in the 2015, 2016, when lymvatinib became available, we see the shift in the first line therapy to um, lymvatinib. And similarly in the second line of therapy, the agent overall most prescribed was um, serafinib. And then in terms of times of um, treatment sequence patterns, so you can see the number of and the y-axis of percent of patients um, in the first line of um, therapy. Um, and then um, the, the patients when they received the second line of therapy. So if they were receiving um, serafinib, that was the second line of therapy then Probably before that, um, most of the patients were receiving serafinib. So what this was probably telling us is that patients took breaks, and then if their doses were decreased, there was a reinitiation of the drugs. We don't have that data to tell us that if a patient was on a starting dose and then went to a second dose. So it wasn't uncommon for us to see that a patient started with one TKI and then again continued this the second TKI as um, time went on. So in conclusion, serafinib was the most common first line agent during the uh, initiation um, from 10, 000, or 2010 to 2014, but was supplanted by lymvatinib started in 2015, uh, again, based on these FDA approvals and efficacies of these drugs. Approximately 36 to 53% um, received a second line therapy of treatment, again, depending on the duration that they were um, followed, um, either greater than than a year or greater than 12, or greater than a month, sorry, or greater than 12 months. And the median treatment duration um, results suggested a potential benefit with these small molecule kinase inhibitors in the second line therapy. And small molecule kinase treatment after the first line failure may be considered appropriately uh, appropriate for a select number of patients. So I think the data here tells us that yes, um, we as practicing clinicians and those who treat thyroid cancers will move on to another tyrosine kinase inhibitor when one fails. What we don't have, um, again, is an exact sequencing about which drug is best to start with and which drug should be continued after that. So some points to consider as before I turn it over here to Eric is that um, uh, this was a retrospective analysis, obviously, and so when we do retrospective studies, they are, in general, hypothesis generating. Um, and currently, lymvatinib is most likely to be used, as we just talked about, um, as first and probably second line therapies of treatment. Again, based on this database, um, looking at patients who probably had higher doses, took breaks, and then had smaller doses. The small majority of the patients will go on to a subsequent um, line of therapy, suggesting that we are likely to improve, you know, um, survival. Um, we have progression-free survival, and most of us think that probably translates to overall survival. Um, right now, we tell patients in general, it's somewhere between three and a half to 4.5 years when they become refractory iodine. But I think we are starting to move and shift the needle um, to the right as um, these agents are more used and we know better how to use these agents. And again, as I mentioned earlier, ideal sequencing of these um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors remains to be determined. So toxicity should never be underestimated. These drugs are um, not easy to take necessarily and they must be prescribed by people who have familiarity with these drugs or else we can reduce the chance for, for efficacy with subsequent lines. I think it's important to point out that data from clinical trials always looks better than in real life. And I think we showed that here with the duration of time that these patients were on treatment, which was less than what was um, seen in the clinical studies because patients aren't followed the same way. Doses are reduced quickly. Um, drug holidays are introduced earlier. So I think that must be taken uh, into the context as well. 
Um, there probably are benefits to drug holidays, but we need to study that better where um, patients are scheduled with a drug holiday versus treating them to a point where they have to stop. And then it's harder to initiate treatment because their performance statuses have deteriorated so, so rapidly and, um, prolonged, and are prolonged. And finally, the um, continued advances in targeted therapies to actual mutations will increase the likelihood of extending treatment in these RAI refractory um, patients. And combination therapies, perhaps with um, checkpoint inhibitors, as we've, as we've been studying with the International Thyroid Oncology Group, may provide a benefit in patients who are progressing on these tyrosine kinases. So um, just as we reflect on this all, the, the, as the telephone changes, so does medicine. And that um, in the 70s and earlier, we had um, adriamycin and then serafinib and lenvatinib. These targeted agents um, were approved in the 2000s and then 2015, up to 2015. And now in the current day, um, we're starting to see some advances as we study more with uh, immunotherapy. So. What we can take from this, again, is that um, there, in all likelihood, is benefit um, from sequencing. The exact benefit uh, from sequencing, we don't know. And, you know, will additional drugs, those with more actionable targets or agents such as immunotherapy added to these um, drugs, add particular benefit where we can see um, you know, longer durations of therapy and perhaps improvements in survival. So I will stop there and um, turn it over to Hi, Carol. Um, yeah, that was really, really great, which could be hard to, to follow up uh, with. Um, and it is like, it is great. Like, it is sort of amazing how you, you now see people more often from across the country than you do sometimes uh, from your own center uh, as, he thinks, as we think have been changing. Um, and I'm not sure how much I'm going to be adding um, to a lot of what Frank's uh, just said, um, going through everything, but, but hopefully it's at least a little bit um, addition. So um, these are my disclosures. Uh, and like when we talk about thyroid cancer, I, I do want to put this up first that, you know, when we look at like a, at, at least follicular thyroid cancers, while most of them are, are papillary 80%, um, we then have 15% of follicular, 3% herpes cell, and 2% anaplastic. And, and a lot of times, these are like all very, very different cancers. And then what I should always add is that there's also a small group of mesurary thyroid cancers as well, which are C-cells. And each of these cancers are treated a little bit differently. And, and I, I do want to put that in because it is not treated differently, but may react differently to treatment. Because that's always something when we do these type of big database studies is that we can tell a lot about you know using codes um, in terms of is it thyroid cancer or not thyroid cancer, um, you know what what they're treated with, but sometimes information like this is not we can't we don't have out. Um, and one of the funny things in thyroid cancer is that even the difference between mesolytic thyroid cancer and papillary thyroid cancer it has the exact same code. And using big databases, we really can't tell the difference. So let's. Start, so I just want to go through briefly um, the again the treatment for RAI refractory thyroid cancer, um, as just as a background of what we're uh, of my discussion of the uh, of the paper, and just really quickly, there's been two randomized studies um, that have been done uh, in this disease that has shown approval of, of drugs. One being serafinib, um, where we see, and I, I want to always emphasize this part. Um, a disease control, uh, progression-free survival of 10.8 months. And then um, the select study uh, where we see um, survival of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a progression-free survival of 18.3 months. And I think a lot of this is, is what Frank was actually talking about in terms of time on study for these patients. We know in the clinical studies that, uh, that a lot of people do come off treatment for SAEs that are related to drug, 20%, almost 20% in serafinib, almost 15% with levatinib. Um, and we also see dose modifications that are very high, around 77% and 67% um, with both drugs. The one thing you always have to focus on is that these, when we're done, we're doing these in studies, these are all predefined. You know, 
a lot of times, sometimes the companies for clinical reasons will allow uh, physicians to decrease the dose uh, with it. But often you really do need to have um, a, a reason to do it. And it has to fit the gray criteria. And it goes both directions. There are some toxicities that patients have that, um, that by a protocol we have to reduce the dose that we don't want to reduce the dose for, but we're required to. And then we also have the exact opposite where um, we really do want to reduce the dose and we try to have to figure out a reason why to do it, but the study doesn't have that as part of the protocol. And then we have to make a decision is, do we do a deviation or not? Real life is different than that. You know, If someone comes in to see, uh, see us in practice um, and they say, you know, um, yeah, they might have this grade two hand foot syndrome or they may just have a sore throat, uh, but they say like, you know, as an example, a patient I had that was a, um, a lawyer early on um, when the study drug first came out, for him, hoarseness of voice was a big deal because he was a lawyer and, and this was his job and it affected him. And that alone was a reason that we would decrease the dose of the drug. But um, a clinical study wouldn't wouldn't require and wouldn't and actually almost wouldn't allow it without it being a deviation. We have to decide how far we would go in a study, but in real life, we make those adjustments differently. Um, the other thing, of course, also is we always start at the top dose and go down. In real life, we're seeing more and more people, especially with like levatinib, start at lower doses, and starting lower doses may definitely be a lot less effective. Same thing with serafinib. Um, and there actually has been a randomized study with levatinib at two different starting doses showing starting at a lower dose leads to uh, worse outcomes. When we look at like the final outcome with each one, you can see with levatinib that um, the data really looks fantastic. And the question always is with the data that looks so good compared to what we saw with serafinib, why do we not always just start with it right away? And we can see with um, levatinib study is that this study showed in the second line setting that levatinib does work and works almost just as well as it does in the first line. There is nothing else during the time frame of this study of anything showing um, a benefit in the second line setting. So anything outside of levatinib, we don't, we didn't have any of that data really like available, and almost all the data we had was was in the first line. So if we did it, so if we do anything that's not levatinib with it, we're doing something that we don't have as, as much evidence with. Now today's time, we do have some data with cabozatin in the second line um, showing um, showing good activity, but really until the, uh, until the cabozatin data, this was really the only data um, with a second line setting. There are phase two studies, NCI guidelines have a lot of the pain proofs um, drugs. So while there, we only have two FDA approved drugs, it is important to notice that we have a lot of drugs available in the United States to use. Exitinib, cabozatinib, zafnib, sunitinib, and venditinib. All were approved for, um, this is actually for follicular cell thyroid cancers. So even, so we can easily get any of these drugs as well as, as was we get the FDA approved drugs without any problems. So when it comes time to make a decision in real life, we have to always make a, a decision is, do we go first with an FDA approved drug or do we think that these data with these other drugs may be as good that we would prefer to go with this approach? Even though they have none of these study drugs except for Vindictim has gone through a randomized study. The interesting part is while Vindictim has gone through a randomized study against placebo, that actually was a negative study yet this one still is available um, for this setting. Medullary thyroid cancer, um, back at this time, is a similar situation where there's been two, there was two randomized studies that have, um, that led to FDA approval of drugs. One is being vindictive against placebo. This was an interesting study in the fact that you did not require progression um, to get onto the study. And because you do not require progression, you see that even the placebo arm does extremely well. But here we can see that vindictinib actually has an extremely long progression-free survival. Not even reached, but the placebo was 19.3 months. And it makes it a little bit more difficult for us to determine that, you know, what is the true progression-free survival from vindictinib in patients that we would actually want to treat at this point in time, which was different in terms of what was done back at that time. Capozantinib is the other FDA-approved drug. 
this drug um, got approved in a randomized study that did require progression to get onto it. So you see that the data seems to be worse in terms of progression-free survival, only now 11.2 months, was a different population. And that's re re reflected in the placebo population, where now we see a progression-free survival of 4.0 months. Neither of these drugs have ever been looked at against each other. It is notable that the cabozantinib study also allowed prior vindictinib. So for mesoroid thyroid cancer, there was definitely, there is data um, suggesting that there is still benefit in using cabozantinib after vindictinib, although it's not, you know, that was a much smaller number than we saw with like the levatinib study in follicular cell thyroid cancer. So let's go on to um, the study that we're discussing Journal Club today by Byfield. So this is a retrospective study using claims data between January 1st, 2010 and May 31st, 2016. What's important about this is stuff that actually um, Dr. Warden has already uh, presented. Levatinib was not approved until 2015. And actually this even covered a period of time when serafinib was not approved for, for thyroid cancer at all. During this period of time, then cabozantinib and vindictinib were approved for, uh, for mesolarite. So these were also things that got approved in the middle of this study. There's 217 patients, which is not a, like a very large amount. Sometimes when we do these big claims data, we want to see, um, you know, one of the big advantages, you could get much higher numbers than you get in like the clinical trials. And the attempts were to really evaluate time on treatment and second line um, therapy for thyroid cancer patients. It is important to note that only thing that can be looked at is the time on treatment not progression-free survival. So this is a different outcome, although a more important outcome that reflects what happens in real life than a progression-free survival. It means you could take people off before they have resist progression, and you could take people off well after they get resist progression, and that is not reflected in, that, in the final outcome. The study seems to include all thyroid cancers, including both metro and anaplastic. And this does make it a little bit more difficult to, to interpret when you're looking at what's going on with each of these drugs, because both of these drugs had different approvals during this period of time. And both had drugs that were able to be used in either setting. So you're looking at drugs that could be used either in medullary or follicular cell, and not sometimes be able to tell the difference in which case it was used on, especially since each one will have actually sometimes different outcomes. Big example is venditinib, which is very effective for metrolytic thyroid cancer, but really has not been suggested to be that um, that beneficial in follicular cell thyroid cancers. Um, yet, we're able to be used um, in either setting. So let's look at like these the outcomes that are there. Um, what this is shown is that is um, in patients who are in what they get in the uh, first, second, third, or fourth, or sorry, patients either got first, one line, two lines, three lines, or four lines of therapy. It's either somewhere between 35.5 and 53.1% of reality of who gets second line therapy. The, uh, the investigators did a very good job in looking at this analysis in two different ways. One is looking for patients who just who had at least one month of follow-up, but the other one is looking for patients with 12 months of follow-up. Why is this important? Well, you don't know if after if they're on if you don't have 12 months of follow-up, then maybe you're just not following them to the point where they could get to this to the second line. That may be either for reasons um, you know, that claims data wasn't able to, to get that, change in insurance, change in, in other reasons, maybe getting the drug in second line because for, for other purposes. And that can, and that might not be able to be reflected on this. The other thing that will be missing a little bit is who's getting second line based on a clinical trial, because that's not always that's not going to be picked up on claims data either. So you so you don't know exactly where as the, that real number like exists with it. And whether, you know, because also the other thing is that 12 months might miss patients who just didn't get the second line uh, because they actually died. Um, so there may be other reasons why they couldn't get to the 12 month period, and maybe the 35.5% is more reality. So we think that it's going to be somewhere in that range, but we don't know exactly where it is. Why is this important about it? Well, I mean, two reasons. One is we always, th at least I always think when I think of thyroid cancer, as in the way I describe it to most patients, is that um, their disease is more like a marathon, not a sprint. That thyroid cancer is not a cancer that is um, often, although sometimes it is, 
not always as aggressive as say like a, a pancreatic cancer or a lung cancer. And um, it's easier to get in our, for my own world and Frank's world, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And it's easier, we think, to get to second and third line. The question is, is it really easier? Just because we think it's easier, it doesn't mean in reality that's really what, what the case is. And why, so why is that important? Well, the data from Levatinib, as we talked about, is that it shows it works pretty equally in the first line and the second line. If we're only going to get to one line treatment, we want our best drug right here in the first line. If we are going to be able to get to four lines of therapy, well, then we need to really think how are we going to sequence the drugs? What is the best way to go from one drug to another? You know, do certain drugs work better in the second line than other drugs? Do other drugs work better in the first line? And a lot of this really take, will take, be taken into account. If we can only get, 30, in reality, 35% of people with the second line, well, then we need to be a lot more aggressive in the first line. If we were able to get, let's say, 100% of people to the second line, well, then, like I said, we need to think about how we sequence these, uh, these drugs a lot better in order to make sure we optimize the long-term care of the patients than going right away to just you know, the best drug and maybe losing um, the, effect, the effect, efficacy of the second, third, and fourth line. So let's, let's look at what the data ends up actually showing. What we're seeing is, is that the median time on um, treatment for a drug like serafinib is 2.8 months. As we saw from the clinical trial, it says 10.8 months. This is, these patients are on it for a much, much, much shorter period of time than we, than we expected. What could be the problem with that? Well, there's several things. One is, is that if this includes all thyroid cancers, including anaplastic, anaplastic thyroid cancers, um, we know from actually some data in serafinib are almost never going to be are going to be on the drug for almost no time. And people were using serafinib for anaplastic back at this time. So is this reflecting, you know, anaplastic? Is this reflecting medullary thyroid cancer, which also does not have great data with serafinib? Does this reflect that people are coming off because of toxicity? Or is this reflecting that people are, are coming off because you start the drug at a low dose and it just doesn't work? Or like you said, maybe in real life, it just doesn't work when you take patients or put patients on study that don't reflect exactly what's in the clinical trial population. Remember, to get on a clinical trial, you need to have low comorbidity, you need to have a good performance status, and we don't put patients, you know, those are not the patients that we always put onto these treatments. So what we're seeing is that there's a different in terms of the reflection of what happens in real life than what we're seeing in the clinical trial, but we, what we don't know right now is why is, is that the case? And that's one of the things that's a little bit more difficult to figure out from claims data. So uh, or sorry, Vindictinib here is looking great at 16.2 months. However, this is a problem is that we don't know if this is reflecting a medullary thyroid cancer population or a, or a flicker cell. My suspicion is that this is probably mostly medullary. That's the other problem we run into claims data is that it, we sometimes just can't figure out what, what's the difference between uh, medullary and follicular and uh, uh, follicular cell thyroid, and I'm not even sure exactly why you know they don't include like that type of difference um, in the coding. But it, that's one of the big problems with using billing data um, to try to figure out like outcomes with it. So we don't know if this is real. What why it reflects like this? The other thing we do see is that during this period of time. While serafinib was probably, I think we all agree, the most studied drug during this time, it was approved uh, for a good period during this uh, the time that studied. You only see, um, well, it definitely, and it also is definitely the one that's most used to start off with. It definitely is not like the the top uh, drug that, sorry, not top drug. It is not the only drug that's used. Levatinib, we don't know how much of that reflect. Well, we do know this really does reflect just period of time when it was um, when it was FDA approved, but we do not know is what the total numbers for that small um, group of things. And what we do see is that people also were more than willing to start with sedentinib, uh, vedentinib, and pizacidib, as well as other drugs as well. So people are not just always following maybe the FDA approved, at least with sedentinib, pizacidib, and other. So what we do see is that just because we have these FDA approved indications, people are picking uh, drugs sometimes based on what they think is the best drug, whether it's because of toxicity or whether because of they think the FDA data might be better, despite the fact that it doesn't have as strong as data. 
or uh, but there is also a group of people that is are picking it maybe because of the FDA approved indication of the drug. Second line becomes very tricky during this period of time because, as I said, during this period of time, we did not have data of second line treatment with the exception of levatinib, and that was only during the last year that, that the study was evaluated. So what does this tell us? Well, one thing it tells us is that we're, um, everyone is, uh, oh, sorry, the one thing we also have a little bit of it was cabozantinib um, data as well for medullary thyroid cancer, although that's the assumption that maybe this was just medullary. What this does tell us is that people are willing to use second line therapy. Not everyone's willing to use it, but people are willing to go off uh, what might be like an FDA approved indi uh, indication or something where there's actually no evidence to support using it with the idea that maybe people are gonna have a benefit. And there was really a lack of other stuff in thyroid, in thyroid cancer. So trying to use something similar does show a benefit. I mean, does, does make sense. When we look at the outcomes with it, uh, interestingly, serafinib looked just as good in the second line. So it got yeah, about five months, cabozant 8.3, unsure whether that's medullary or, or not, 5.7 for all these other ones. So you do see people on it for a well beyond two month period. However, we have no idea why you know these people came off of it. Um, and I've definitely seen um, people stay on second line treatment even longer or beyond progression when the feeling was that there's nothing else available. And you know, if there's nothing else available, let's just keep them on the drug, even though um, it's not working. Um, and we don't know how much of that reflects it or how much it reflects that there is activity uh, at this point in time. But we definitely see that people are more than willing to do it, but there's a lot of people who didn't get to the second line and we don't, and that we don't know is because of course there are people who just were not willing to do, people, I mean physicians that willing to do second line or whether the patients were not at the point where clinically they were able to get second line treatment. So let's look at the conclusions of the study and then and then try to figure out what, what would be our um, analysis of this. First, serafinib is the most common first line drug between 2010 and 2014, but levatinib is now becoming more, became the most common almost as soon as it got FDA approved. Well, this is always difficult to consider because we have to assume, the assumption is that both MTC and ATC patients will be included. And while MTC and ATC might be a very small percentage of all thyroid cancers, when it comes to people being treated on these drugs, their, their percentage actually goes up quite a bit. And when we see why people die of disease, um, ATC, while not anywhere near as high as papillary, goes up quite high. Probably indicated these people, when it comes to getting treatment for systemic therapies, will probably lead to a, a higher percentage than what we might think. Same thing with MTC. It also, this is a different era of, of targeted therapies. And, you know, after this time, um, a lot of things that I think Frank already started talking about, and I'm going to talk about quickly, is that there are other drugs that are, are you know, coming around that hits different mutational targets. And those are becoming more and more important. Um, and without, with the exception of only one or two getting FDA approved, um, there are some ones that some people will prefer to use in the front line. Uh, because uh, of less toxicity. The next thing is that around 36 to 50 percent of patients receive second line therapy. And while it's important that people are getting it, this is really difficult to tell because we don't know if this is due to the inability to receive second line or lack of options, meaning lack of FDA options. And so we don't know is this you know a patient driven or physician driven for uh, for second line on why more people didn't get it. Um, and, and, that, and that's just a difficult thing. So we know what happens in real life. The real thing, what we don't know is why is this happening? Um, and we don't know if we're missing some things uh, when it comes to claim data because patients are, are switching insurance, um, going to other areas. The last thing is the median treatment uh, uh, duration suggests like there is benefit in the second line. Um, but the study does not measure progression. And we don't know if people are kept on just because they're due to a, a lack of other options. So what we do see is that median time of treatment is not the same as progression of free survival seen in the clinical studies. But what we don't know is why is it different? Is it different because you know people come off earlier because of toxicities, people remain on it longer uh, because of a lack of other options? And these are things that the claim data doesn't let us know the answer to, at least you know at this point in time. 
but it does give us um, clues into what you know um, what the hypothesis is generating and gives us things about what we might want to look at in the future um, to try to answer that type of question. So what have we learned from all this? Well, one is we know that time on treatment in real life does not reflect what happens in clinical trials. This may be because resist is not really important in real life, even though it is important for a study. Toxicities may be either be more important or, or less important. And we don't know how that plays a role in people coming off treatment earlier or people coming off treatment later than, than what happens in the different study. And other options also may, may play a role. So what are other things that patients uh, may be uh, able to get onto, uh, may uh, play something? If, you know, I definitely have had, you know, despite the fact that I'm one of those people who's more than willing to go through third, fourth, fifth line treatment, um, despite a lack of data there, I have definitely have seen patients from physicians on the outside who, you know, the patients on second line, second line, they're progressing on second line, and they're saying there's no other option available because they're going like exactly, by, you know, which I can easily say is appropriate, but they're going by exactly what's out there in terms of the randomized studies. And you say, these are the two FDA approved drugs. If you progress on both those FDA approved drugs, right now we don't have like another option. Um, even though there's a number of drugs that are competitive improved. The second thing we learned about second line treatment, we are unsure if we are willing to try things without evidence or are patients having more difficulty than we assume getting to multiple lines. So like I said, my assumption has always been with my patients is that, yeah, overall, I think I could get almost everyone onto second line. But just because I think that I, that's true, it doesn't mean at all that it really is true. Um, and it could be that it, it really is more difficult to get people on second line than my assumption has always been. Um, it also could be that we're not we're seeing some more numbers because when we look in real life, a lot of people are just not willing to try things without like more evidence to do it. So like I said, this is something we don't know if it's patient driven or if it's physician driven. Uh, but, but that is the hypothesis generating um, outcome that this study has been able to, uh, to come with and really suggest that this is something we should look at. The last thing is that this is an important study because it does reflect differences in real life. You know, we, we have a tendency of reporting um, in, you know, in New England Journal of Medicine, these outcomes of randomized studies. But, there, but what this study really says is that what happens in these clinical studies is not what always happens in the real world. And we sort of need to figure out why is the real world different. But the big problem with these studies is that they're not updated to what we're doing today. So, you know, when you go through like these claims data, um, you know, it's not like, you know, it's May 20th, 2000, or sorry, it's not May 20th, because I don't even know what day it is. It's not December, and I look at my watch now, 11th, 2020. So if I'm asking for that claims data, I'm gonna be able to get everything up to December 19th, 2020. It takes a while to get this all set up um, to work. And there are many of these different large databases out there um, that can be used. One is claims data, one is the Medicare SEER database, which in some ways is a little bit, has some more accuracy, in other ways has a lot less accuracy. But all these da big databases, you have to go back a few years. And when you have a disease where all of a sudden things are now changing quite a bit, it's hard to figure out what is, you know, we now know what the lesson is from up to 2016, but we don't know how in real life is in 2020. And this is something we always want, we need to sort of, I think, keep going up, you know, updated. And this is definitely something where the investigators can easily repeat this study again, um, using the same data, but trying to go up to 2020 or 2019, wherever it can be done. Um, because I think what's going on now is, is a different world than what was happening uh, back then, um, especially with levatinib. And that's what we sort of need to figure out is where is levatinib playing a role um, in patient first that my treatment? but all these other drugs and all these target therapies. And that's why I always want to put in is, is that one of the more important things out there is what is the role of these molecular target therapies in thyroid cancer? And they the actually are playing a very, very big role. You know, thyroid cancer is just to focus on everyone is, is that we have targets. You know, this is not, you know, like my other real world is head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And head and neck squamous cell carcinoma yeah, there may be some targets, but they're really rare, and they don't really, really a limited number of ones where we have like any type of real option with it. 
here, BRAF alone um, is a very high number of papillary thyroid cancers, and that we know we have BRAF target therapies. When you look down at BRAF fusion genes, there are new drugs being studied that, that may target BRAF fusion genes very well. Red fusion and intract fusion genes, while a very small percentage, are also things um, that we have new drugs that can really target uh, extremely well. Even these other things out there, like uh, P10, um, K, some of the KRAS um, drugs, uh, HRAS and NRAS uh, slightly, these are things that either that there's a lot of investigations into drugs that, and sorry, in the last one's our NF1, there is a lot of evaluation of drugs to really be able to target these things. And while they may play a much smaller percentage, this will play a very big role in how we treat the cancer. And it makes it even more difficult to tell if we're looking at just like VEGF um, TKIs. And, you know, when you look at now papillary thyroid cancer, um, and I think this is true for thyroid cancer in general, but papillary being like the main one, um, we have a lot of targets, and this makes things even more confusing between the first line, second line, and third line. And where are the roles of this? You know, for BRAF, you know, we've had several uh, studies, all of them phase two. Um, they have shown activity with BRAF inhibitors, but how this plays a role um, compared to VEGF TKIs, how it plays a role in sequencing, we don't know. Um, you know, we all have our ideas about how they do in terms of uh, morbidity, but we don't really know like where we should be putting them. RET and NTRAC are the two new big hot targets, especially RET. Two, we now have two specific RET inhibitors that are FDA approved that will offer um, RET fusion in thyroid cancers, as well, of course, RET mutations in medullary thyroid cancer. And while there's no question about how active they are in the first line, we actually know that they're very active in the second line as well. And we don't know um, as much data about what happens for activity afterwards, after they're on, people are on the drugs. Is it better to, you know, how do we sequence them with other drugs like capozantinib and vindicinib? And, and this one's a lot harder than the levatinib question in terms of sequencing because these drugs are so well tolerated compared to other drugs that we have out there that almost everyone wants to start with them, but it could be that it's much better to, to do this later. and Maybe start with a, a more toxic drug because in the long run, people would do better with it. And we just, and like I said, we just don't know the answer. The last thing is RAS. RAS is not really always considered targetable. However, there is data using um, a drug like tepifarnib um, having activity against HRAS mutations in squamous cell carcinoma of the head and neck. There has been ver a very little bit of data in thyroid cancer, um, but looking, but there's no question that the population that's been looked so far in, in thyroid cancer has been extremely small, and that may be a very good target eventually in the future. KRAS and, and even NRAS may also be uh, very reasonable targets um, with either using MEK inhibitors in combination with other drugs or um, some of the new KRAS inhibitors in a very subset of, of KRAS uh, mutations may also have like a little bit of a role. So these whole, the whole target therapies makes the whole story of, of how we see clinical drugs and what people are, are doing and are going to do in real life um, even more confusing. And a reason to like update it, but even when you try to update like that data from, from the study, um, you know, things just change so quickly, it's hard to like to keep up with it. And that, and like I said, the amount of data um, that's good for the data claims may go back a few years and you, be, and you may miss completely what's going on today. Um, I always like to say is that sometimes we do sort of wonder if there really is anything more in life than lacking the mystery of the thyroid. So we know that this is probably by far and away the most important thing um, out there. But at the same time, um, you know, I'd say it, it, it's a very interesting field and, you know, it is ch changing so quickly, which makes it even more exciting, which is very different than, you know, when Frank and I were foes and the, pro and the world wasn't changing that much in thyroid cancer. So, Great. Uh, awesome. Um, and uh, sorry to interrupt there, Eric. I'm wondering if um, these were two outstanding presentations.
I'm going to give Frank the first option here to comment if he has any thoughts on what Eric uh, presented. I think this was really an outstanding um, discussion of this important topic. Yeah, thanks. So it's interesting. I, I agree with Eric wholeheartedly. So, um, you know, just to kind of highlight that, um, yes, there are opportunities, you know, for patients. I think we're, you know, showing that here and with um, ongoing studies, his point about um, selecting the right drug first probably makes the most sense. And looking at the lymvatinib data, for example, if you want to attain a response um, because someone has a large neck mass or is having extremely um, a hard time breathing, um, that may be a good first option. Um, but moving into what he just finished with, maybe it does make sense for us to sequence every patient up front and then start with these targeted therapies. Um, one thing he didn't mention was that the side effect profiles probably are a little more tolerable than these multi-kinase inhibitor side effect profiles. So um, that will be important for us as we continue to move forward in this field to really identify what sequence um, makes sense for you know, what patients. So, um, as he alluded to, that the field is forever changing, and um, we're lucky that we do have targets to work with in um, this particular cancer as compared to, to other cancers. Thank you. Um, so maybe if both of you could comment, um, at this point in time, if you have a specific target um, that is actionable, what is what do you do? What are you doing um, in December? 2020 when you're facing an RAI refractory patient? Are you going with um, one of uh, the small mole uh, molecule kinase inhibitors or do you, are you, is that your first target, your first um, line of defense um, or offense? Um, and are you considering combination therapy at this point with um, SMKI and a specific targeted treatment? Um, I guess I could go first. So um, my belief is that um, all of these patients who, who show up with the refra iodine refractory thyroid cancers um, should be sequenced um, because we do have these uh, approved drugs. So my preference would be if I find a rest fusion, for example, in a papillary thyroid cancer that I would start with um, prelcetinib or salpercetinib. Um, first, interestingly, um, having used these drugs on these clinical trials and then crossing over when one failed, um, there may be benefit from going from one RET inhibitor to another one. Uh, personally, I think, as I alluded to earlier, that the toxicity profiles are better since you're targeting one kinase versus um, multiple kinases, which lead to more fatigue issues with hypertension, proteinuria, et cetera. So Eric mentioned this in his presentation. I think it's a, a point to bring up that um, people in the second line setting, why didn't they get it? Was it for you know, a reason related to toxicity, for example? Some of these patients come in not just with thyroid cancer, but with other um, comorbid illnesses. So if we lose our opportunity to um, give them the best shot to treat their cancer, um, that may make it more difficult, meaning that if we um, kind of run them into the ground or make things worse with lymvatinib up front, it may not provide the benefit, you know, that they could attain um, from tolerating a, a second line therapy. So my opinion is we should be coming up front with um, these targeted therapies. To add another therapy with that, I don't think we have data yet to suggest that um, we are exploring that with certain agents. Um, but right now in December 2020, I don't think we have enough data to say that we should be combining it. I pretty much agree exactly with what Frank says is that, you know, it, it, one is it is very patient dependent. Um, you know, uh, you know, you do look, see, are you able to get to more than one line? Can you only do one line? What is the morbidity and what kind of performance status does the patient have? You know, obviously if the person has like really bad hypertension, that's not well controlled at all, 
um, you really push more towards trying to use a drug that does not have a VEGF effect, which is, I mean, sorry, does not have a hypertensive effect, which mostly means um, a target therapy. Um, if, uh, if it's a great looking patient coming in who, you know, very little morbidity, younger side, um, my preference usually is to start with a target therapy uh, in general. Um, I, I do say it includes with the BRAF inhibitors as well as the RET inhibitors and TREC inhibitors. I don't know if that's always the best option. Like I said, we don't know how to best sequencing them, but usually that's the way I would start off with. Um, I do find the big difference between NTRAC and the RET inhibitors versus the BRAF inhibitors is that NTRAC and RET, at least in their small studies, have response rates that are basically equivalent, if not perhaps maybe better than levatinib. But that's not as true with the BRAF inhibitors as a single agent. So at least when I'm using a BRAF inhibitor as a single agent, um, I will, if, and you have an aggressive disease with a BRAF mutation, I will actually go with levatinib first. Um, all together. But I do understand that, that we just don't know the sequencing question. And, and at least right now, you know, there is a randomized study for uh, patients with um, RET mutation, or sorry, uh, yeah, RET mutations in mesolary thyroid cancer. And uh, where they either start with, um, you know, when the RET inhibitors, um, and when we're doing some with sulpercatinib, or they start with either vindictinib or cabozantinib. And then if the gefedipra cabozantinib, the event could cross over to, re to receive um, the, the RET inhibitor. And I actually think that's an important sequencing question. Um, so I do encourage patients to think about that study. Um, I will say that most people don't want to do that study. The, you know, they heard so much about the, um, the better tolerability of the RET inhibitors, that they want to start off with a drug that has the least side effects. And in some ways, that's more important to the patient uh, with thyroid cancer, at least from my experience, um, than, than even efficacy. Sometimes efficacy is, is more important, but more likely than not in the differentiated world, the, um, I find more patients really want to have something that they will be able to tolerate. Um, and I think that just has to reflect, like, you know, the, the history of the disease compared to like a cancer like pancreatic or even anaplastic that will appear very suddenly and you just want something that's going to work as quickly as, as possible and as, as well as possible. Terrific. Um, I apologize I, uh, to our attendants, um, attendees and to our speakers. Unfortunately, we are pushing uh, the nine o'clock hour. Um, so I, I can't thank um, uh, Dr. Warden and Dr. Sherman enough for their really outstanding discussion of this really important topic. I think we could go on for at least another hour with the questions, um, but unfortunately unable to do so. So I want to thank everybody for attending. I also want to make sure that I thank our partner uh, Lilly Oncology for sponsoring this wonderful session this morning. And as always, I invite you to come back next week and join us for um, another uh, journal club and uh, please encourage anyone that um, is, a bit, is interested in this presentation, it will be available as a recorded session um, starting the beginning of next week. So as always, everybody stay safe and um, uh, enjoy the weekend. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you.